All right, all right, all right. Well, today we begin a brand new series entitled FaceTime. Come on, can you say FaceTime? FaceTime. FaceTime. The next number of weeks, we are returning to the Gospel of John, and we're going to continue out this year in John's Gospel. And we're going to be looking at a number of face-to-face conversations that Jesus has with individuals just like me and just like you. Face-to-face conversations. And And here's my hope and my prayer for each and every one of us, that in the coming weeks, we would intentionally engage in some FaceTime conversations with Jesus ourselves, that we would lean a little bit closer. You see, throughout John's gospel, we see these these glimpses where Jesus approaches people, and it's significant because of this truth, that our God desires to be personal with us. And here's what I know. When we get personal with God, powerful things can happen. When we actually lean in to relationship and what he offers us, and as we look throughout scripture, it's not just a New Testament reality. In fact, one of my favorite scriptures from the book of Exodus talks about the way that Moses would engage in conversation with God. Consider this as we begin this series today. Exodus chapter 33 Verse 11, it says this, that the Lord would speak with Moses face to face. Can you say face to face? -face. How many know that? That's a big thought right there. That God, all powerful, spoke everything we know into existence with mere words. God would speak face to face. But listen to this next part. He would speak face to face with Moses just as a man speaks with his friend. Let me ask you, when you think about having conversation with God, do you have that level of personal contact? Do you have that level of of knowing him? Or does prayer feel a little bit more rigid? Does this idea of knowing God at that level feel a little bit distant or a little bit abstract? Because here's what I know. What was rare for people like Moses is available now to each and every one of us. That might sound like a big statement to you, but understand, God by his spirit dwells with us. That means we can lean in and have a personal encounter with God. And and again, I want you to hear this. I want this to be etched in our hearts. When we get personal with God, powerful things can happen. And here's one of my concerns. I wonder how many of us, we've had powerful moments with God, but it was a long time ago. Maybe that powerful moment was decades ago or years ago. And and here's what I want us to understand is that we have that available to us today. He wants to be personal. See, in the weeks ahead, we're going to look at some of the face-to-face conversations that Jesus has with people. And we're going to learn that Jesus is willing to engage in conversations with both skeptics and sinners, with doubters and those who are disregarded by others. I love what Professor Jerry Stitzer says. He says this, that in John's gospel, encounters with the human Jesus turn into encounters with God. You see, we're going to see a number of conversations where at first they think they're just talking to a man named Jesus. By the end of the story, they confess that he is much more. They confess that they have met with God. Today, as we begin, I want you to reflect on your own life. Have you ever had one of those moments where you found yourself in a conversation with someone and you were thinking to yourself, how do you know me? You ever had that awkward moment? Somebody comes up to you, they begin to talk to you like they know you, and in the back of your mind, you're like, okay, I don't know you, but you're talking like you know me, but I'm going to act like I know you, but I'm troubled by this conversation. Have you had that moment? It's interesting. Someone, they appear to know you, but you don't feel like you know them. If we're honest, social media has made this more complex in our world. Because social media gives us a glimpse into people's lives. We see their their cleverly cropped photos and their their series of reels and stories that that makes us feel like we know them, but they don't really know us. A number of years ago, I was speaking at a conference, and 
There was a guy who I've followed on social media for years, and I happened to be in the same hallway, and I, I called out to him, and I began to talk to him, and, you know, I was acting like I, I knew him because I, I see what's going on in his life via social media, and I could tell he had this look where he's trying to be nice, but in the back of his mind, I know he's going, dude, how do you know me? Because I don't know you. See, here's the truth. We, we, at times, maybe we engage people and we, we know things about them, but we don't really know them. And maybe we find ourselves going, how, how do you know me? Today, I want us to understand something important. It's maybe a little bit of a crazy thought for some of us. God, who is your creator, actually knows you. He knows every detail about you. Yes, he knows what you did last summer. He, he knows all of it. And guess what? He actually loves you. And not only that, he likes you. And he wants to get, here's the point, he wants to get personal with you. He wants to get personal with you. See, today we're going to John chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, get those ready, whether it's on your phone or you have a paper version. We're, we're going to look at an important story with a man named Nathaniel. And here's what we're going to learn. One conversation with Jesus can turn a doubter into a disciple. I, I'm convinced of this more now than ever before, that one conversation, one moment with Jesus can change everything. And here's my concern, is that some of us, instead of leaning into conversation with Jesus, we've settled for knowing information or facts about Jesus. It's a little bit like we, we look to scripture like we're reading or watching somebody's social media account. We, we know things about them, but we don't really know him. And this is why this journey over the next few weeks is so important for us as Life Center, because we are going to lean in to personal moments with God. Why? Because if we will get personal with God, powerful things can happen. We're about to see that one conversation with Jesus turns a doubter into a disciple. In John chapter one, we see Jesus beginning to call disciples into a journey with him. Look with me to John chapter one. We're gonna start in verse 43. It says this, the next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee, he found Philip and told him, follow me. Can you say, follow me? Follow. Now, we've talked about this before, but again, Jesus is not simply inviting somebody to go for a walk with him. He's not lonely, he's not bored, he's not looking for companionship. This idea is an, an invitation from a rabbi, from a teacher to say, walk behind me, keep in step with me, begin to pattern your life after me. Jesus says, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Philip's excited. Why? Because they realize Jesus is the Messiah, both the Old Testament law and prophets said there would be one who would come who would be the anointed one, the Messiah, who would actually bring freedom and hope to the people of Israel. They realize Jesus is this person. But much like our modern day, people back then could not accept the fact that exceptional people might come from ordinary places. It was incompatible. Philip's so excited, he says, guess what? We found Jesus. He's the son of Joseph from Nazareth. And, and listen to Nathaniel's response. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? He's a doubter. How many of you know there's people in our world right now when they think about the church, can anything good come out of the church? Can anything good come out of an organization like that? I've had multiple conversations with people as I've been traveling a little bit the last number of weeks, and when they hear I'm from Tacoma, they kind of look at me with a little bit of a similar attitude. <laughs> Tacoma, 
Can anything good come out of Tacoma? I mean, no, there's this stigma, there's this perspective of, of the West Coast that somehow God has left the West Coast and now he just resides in the middle of America. And it's almost like there's this ideal, like Tacoma, the West Coast. Can anything good, and here's what I want to remind you, God is in the midst of his people. And where God shows up, powerful things can happen. And here's a doubter who's looking at this statement from Philip saying, Nazareth, important people are supposed to come from important places. But little did Nathaniel know that although Jesus grew up in a town called Nazareth, he was the one born in the city of Bethlehem, fulfilling the prophets, fulfilling the very thing that God had promised his people. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I love Philip's answer. Come and see. Come on, that's a good answer right there. What I love is that Philip did not feel the need to try to defend Jesus. Like, well, you're not from an important place either. He doesn't resort to, to throwing verbal bricks back. He simply replies with a three-word invitation. And by the way, this is good news for each and every one of us. And this is what I want you to know today. Because some of you, you've been following Jesus for a long time. Others of you, you're here trying to figure out what's what in your life. And today, my job, my assignment is not to try to convince you. My job is not to try to somehow argue you into believing something. My job is to simply say this, come and see. Come and see. Because if I can argue somebody into faith, guess what? They can be argued out of it. But I've encountered Jesus myself, and I know he's real. I know he's alive. He's met me in the dark moments of the night. He's met me in places of despair. And nobody can argue or take that away from me. And so all I offer to each and every one of us is this. Come and see for yourself. Come and see. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Thanks, Jesus. But what's the significance of Jesus greeting a man who he has not yet met with that type of greeting? Well, to understand this, you have to go back to the book of Genesis. There was a man named Jacob. Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the one who carried the promise of the covenant. Jacob's name would later be turned to Israel, the father of 12, who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel. What's interesting about Jacob, before his name was changed, the word Jacob means this, deceiver, heel grabber, trickster. And Jesus says, here is a true son, as Nathaniel is walking towards, here's a true son of Israel in whom there is no deceit. In other words, guess what? You are different. You are truthful. Goes on. How do you know me? I love that question. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. And before Philip called you, Jesus said, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Rabbi, Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. And Jesus responded, do you believe because I saw you under the fig tree? you will see greater things than this. Then he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Again, in the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, Jacob, whose name is changed to Esau, falls asleep at a place called Bethel. And he has a vision where heaven is opened and he sees this ladder or this stairway to heaven where the angels are ascending and descending. Jesus is letting Nathaniel know, guess what? What Jacob just saw from a distance, you are going to see in full reality. 
See, the good news for each and every one of us today is this. Jesus came to erase the gap between where we are and where we're meant to be. Jesus, he wants to erase that gap. He he sees this man named Nathaniel, who's a doubter. That's where he is. That's where life is being lived. And he says, listen, I I see where you are, but, but there's so much more. I want you to be my disciple. And it's one face-to-face conversation. It's one come-and-see moment that changes everything for Nathaniel. See, I'm convinced one conversation with Jesus can change everything. Instead of just having information or stories or stats or data about Jesus, you can have the real thing. Jesus came to erase the gap. You see, today, where I am, I know that I'm a man broken by sin, but where I'm meant to be is bound up in the mercy and the grace of Jesus. Maybe that's your story. Where you are today, you might be anxious, worried, or worn out, but where you're meant to be, you're meant to be at peace. You're meant to be confident in an everlasting hope, not that you produce, but that you receive. Maybe today where you are, you're driven by fear, but guess where you're meant to be? You are meant to be filled with faith. Today, maybe you find yourself intoxicated by the illusion of control. That somehow you you can control the outcome of your life. That, That if you just work a little bit harder, try a little bit more to be a little bit better, that things will tilt in your direction. And I can't tell you how many people I meet were intoxicated with that illusion that somehow we can control this thing called life. But guess where we're meant to be? We're meant to be filled with the power of the Spirit, knowing that God is the one who's in control. See, Jesus has a desire for each of us today, and what is that? It's transformation. It's not just information. So maybe you you came today, maybe you're tuning in today, and you're, you're just looking for some information. You're looking for some inspiration, but... Today, we need to understand Jesus offers us so much more. He he actually desires transformation in our lives. What that means is Jesus cannot ignore the purpose that he gives us in his grace and the potential that he gives us in his grace. He wants to transform your life. What this means is that faith in Jesus that doesn't change you should cause you concern. If you have a faith in Jesus, but your life has not changed, that should cause you concern. Why? Because Jesus is interested in transforming you. And maybe all of your transformation was, was decades ago. You remember when you raised your hand, you prayed the prayer, maybe you walked forward in a church service, but that was the last time you experienced change, can I remind you that there's an invitation to get personal with God. And when we get personal with God, powerful things can happen. When was the last time that that there was a shift inside of you? When was the last, last time that you encountered God in such a real way that parts of your attitude change, parts of your character change, parts of your appetites change, parts of your, your words change. See, grace, grace is amazing, is it not? Unearned, undeserved favor. But understand, grace doesn't just get you in, grace also grows you up. In other words, it, it changes you. Every day I watch my kids, we have three teenagers now, and, and I watch them change day after day, after day, and in a very similar way as followers of Jesus who are encountering and living in a relationship with God, we are called to be transformed, amen? Scripture says God's people go from strength to strength, from grace to grace. Understand, he he loves you without a doubt, but the master, he will never be satisfied until we look like him, reflect him, and reveal him in our lives. So is it time to come face to face with Jesus for you? I love this question that Nathaniel asked. How do you know me? 
And I wonder how many of us, we, we would have a similar response as we create room for God to, to begin to impress on us. We ask that question, God, God, how do you know all these details? How is it that you see all of this stuff? You see, just like Jesus saw Nathaniel, Jesus sees us. He, he knows us. He sees your purpose, what you were actually created to be, not just what you currently are. He also sees your potential. Again, not just where you are, but where you can be in his grace and mercy working in your life. And so today, I, I want to make a powerful application and a personal application from this. Because again, when we get personal with God, powerful things can happen. So here's first a personal truth. Jesus, he sees you and he knows you before you seek him out. Today, some of us, we're convinced that, that if we just try a little bit harder, if we draw a little bit closer in our own strength, that somehow we are the solution, we are the source to our breakthrough. But understand, Jesus, he, he already sees you and he already knows you before you ever took a step in his direction. As we looked at these few verses today in John chapter 1, three different times we saw this word found. The question that we have to ask is, who is actually finding who? Philip's convinced he found Jesus, but as we look at the story, Jesus actually found Philip. Nathaniel thinks he's finding, but no, it's Jesus finding Nathaniel. Who is finding who? I, I love that Philip, in the midst of all of Nathaniel's questions, in the midst of his doubts, he gives him three words. Come and see. Come and see. See, these three words should provide some relief for those of us who have ever felt the weight that it's our job to convince somebody of Jesus. How many of you have ever engaged in that argument, trying to convince somebody? Some of you guys, you've, you've gotten in yelling matches online via Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And here's, here's the challenge. If you can argue somebody into relationship with Jesus, somebody else can argue them out. And so this should lift a burden off of our back because all our response should be to people, come and see. Man, you believe in that whole God thing? You believe in the church? You believe that Jesus is actually alive? Come and see. But you'll never say come and see unless you've experienced it yourself. See, this is the danger. So, some of us, we, we've settled for stories and information like, like watching the social media from a distance instead of knowing the real thing ourselves. But friends, capture this. God is willing to get personal with you. He's inviting us. Lean in. See what I have to say. See, it's not our job to try to argue somebody into believing. It's not gonna happen. Come and see. Even today, I, I don't have to argue with any of you. Why? Because I've experienced it myself. I've seen how God has worked in my life. I, I've seen how grace meets me. I've seen the goodness and the faithfulness of God. Nobody can take that from me. And here's what I want you to know. You can live with that same conviction, that same belief, that same hope, that, that same trust. But we've got to be willing to lean into some FaceTime moments with Jesus. See, Jesus, he already saw and he already knew Nathaniel before Nathaniel ever took a step in his direction. In theology, there's some important words. Maybe you've heard these, but I think they're helpful for us as we wrap our hearts around this idea, hey, God actually sees me and knows me. How, how is that possible? Well, theology, in other words, as we look through the whole course of scripture, we, we learn some things about God. Number one, that God is omnipresent. In other words, God is everywhere. How many know that's really good news or it's really bad news, depending on how you want to read that? God is everywhere. Here's what I know. 
Even though there's, there's opposition in our lives, there's very real demonic forces at work, guess what? There's no demon that can be everywhere at once. Even the devil cannot be everywhere at once. Only our God is everywhere at once. Friends, that's important truth for you to hold on to. Not only is God omnipresent, but he's omnipotent. In other words, he's all-powerful. Here's what I know. I'm not all-powerful. And I hate to break it to you today. Guess what? You're not all-powerful. Only God is all-powerful. But not only that, your God is also omniscient. He is all-knowing. This is what turns a doubter into a disciple because Nathaniel goes, how did you know who I am? And Jesus says, I saw you when you were under a tree. There he is alone. Most rabbis would consider that a place of study and Nathaniel is there under that tree and Jesus says, Nathaniel, I saw you there when you didn't even realize I could see you there. And some of us, our lives would be turned upside down if we would just realize God saw us in that moment where we thought we were all alone. God saw us when everybody else fled from our lives. God saw us and he was with us and he's been waiting for us to just simply lean in to relationship with him. Understand, he saw you and he knew you before you ever moved in his direction. Here's, here's a powerful truth. That's the personal truth. Here's the powerful truth is that Jesus has more for you. Jesus has more for you. I love what Jesus tells Nathaniel in verse 50. He says, Nathaniel, if this amazes you, guess what? You're gonna see even greater things. What's he referring to? Well, again, he, he made that play on words about how he is a true Israelite in whom there's no deceit. You see, unlike Jacob, Nathaniel, there's, there's something distinguished in his life. There's something set apart in his life. And Jesus goes on to say, Nathaniel, the very thing that Jacob saw from a distance, you are going to have a full revelation of. He goes back to the story where Jacob has this vision of heaven and earth overlapping. And Jesus says to Nathaniel, guess what? I'm not just telling you about the ladder to heaven. I am the ladder to heaven. I am the way. I am the source. Nathaniel, you're going to see the full reality of this. Jesus doesn't just tell us the way to heaven. Friends, he declares he is the way to heaven. We lean into him. We trust him. And there's so much more that Jesus has for us than simply kind of floating in and floating out once every seven days. There's so much more that he wants to reveal to you. This is why he came, friends. He came to erase the gap between where we are and where we are meant to be. He's still moving doubters to become disciples. And yet it all comes back to this place. Will we become personal with God? He welcomes it. I think that's why communion is such an important rhythm in our lives as followers of Jesus. Christians from the very beginning, we read in the book of Acts that they instituted this as Jesus called them to do, to come back to the Lord's table again and again to remember that we serve the God who came to erase the gap between where we are and where we're meant to be. That's what communion declares. And so today, we are going to set aside just our closing moments together for this sacred act and this sacred response of remembering the Lord's death and his sacrifice, but also remembering his resurrection. So today we're gonna partake of communion together. And today, if you didn't receive communion elements, would you raise a hand because our ushers wanna make sure that everybody has communion elements so that we can partake together today. For those who are worshiping with us at home, I wanna encourage you to grab something that you can, in this moment, participate with us. In a moment, we're going to partake of these elements together. But before I do, I did this in our early gathering. I'm going to do this in this gathering. I'll do it in our next gathering as well. But maybe you're here today, 
And you need to be reminded that even before taking communion of this important truth, that this only becomes powerful when it's become personal. See, communion is this reminder that that God sees us and that God knows us. He knew our inability. He sees our brokenness. And so he clothed himself in humanity. He became one of us. He died in our place, took the punishment that we deserve. And yet he defeated death and sin in the grave. And today, friends, the grave is empty. Jesus is alive. And that is our hope. We rejoice in that. We rest in that. Communion is this declaration as well, though, that that God has more for me, more than just what you're experiencing right here, right now. Friends, there is eternity with him that is guaranteed. Amen. Amen. There's more than just right now. So you might be in the most discouraging moment of your life. Guess what? As you partake of this bread and as you drink of this cup, you are prophetically declaring over your situation, this is not the end. Come on, I'm praying that the church would wake up and lean into the fact that God is moving. God is alive. I don't care what the rest of America says. Tacoma, can anything good come out of Tacoma? It can because God is in the midst of his people. He calls us to be witnesses of that truth. So do not miss the significance of this moment. Today, it must become personal. And when we get personal with God, guess what? Powerful things can happen. I've been praying for you this week that some of us, we would have a personal encounter with God today, face to face, If it can happen with Moses, guess what? It can happen with us. We live on this side of the new covenant. That's what we are about to remember and declare. That we have access to God, not because of our activity for him, but because of what he's done for us. Yet today, some of us, we need to make this personal. So I'm gonna invite us quickly to simply bow our heads for a moment. If you're in this room and you know that you need to make a personal decision to dedicate your life to Jesus, that your sin would be forgiven, that your debt would be paid. You want to make him king and Lord of your life today. If that's you, can I invite you with a simple response just to raise a hand, just hold it up for a moment, say, yep, that's me, that's me, yeah, 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 yeah. Father, you see every hand that was raised today. Lord, thank you that the work that you've accomplished for us in your life, your death, and in your resurrection, it's more than enough for us. Lord, I pray that today it would be a reminder for each and every one of us that we can lean in to personal relationship with you. God, I pray that we as Life Center, we would never be satisfied with just looking at you from a distance. But God, I pray in the coming weeks that you and your sovereign grace would begin to do something new in the heart of your people. Jesus, you desire to transform us. And I pray for those who maybe it's been a while since anything has changed in their lives. God, may we be on a collision course in the coming weeks with your presence and your power working in our lives. God, we want face-to-face moments with you. God, would you transform us? God, I thank you for friends who raised a hand. Thank you that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Communion is the great declaration of that reality, and we thank you for it. I invite you to peel back that first layer today and grab that wafer of bread and hold it in your hand. 
Scripture says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he shared a meal with his friends. He took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So today, as we partake of the bread, understand, we are declaring, we are remembering that Jesus, he gave his body, he laid down his life for us. Lord, as we hold this bread, we want to say thank you. Thank you for loving us, not just with words, but with your life. Thank you for living the life we couldn't live. You died the death we all should have died. But you rose again. And today you are alive. And Lord, as we take this bread, we remember your words that you declared you are the bread of life. Lord, today we find the source and the solution for every craving in our life. It's found in you. You are the source. You are the solution. We thank you for it. Let's go ahead and partake of the bread. Scripture continues that after supper, Jesus took a cup. He said that this is a new covenant confirmed in his blood. The covenants throughout scripture always had two sides, God's part and man's part. But what's interesting about this new covenant, Jesus says that it's one-sided. It's confirmed in his work, not in our effort. We have to simply receive what he's done for us. That's why as we declare and we remember the blood that was shed for us, understand we are recipients of a new and greater thing. We have access to God. Life Center, I want to encourage you this week and the coming weeks, don't stand at a distance when you can get personal with God because of his blood that's made a way for you. Jesus, thank you for your blood that was shed for us. We remember the scripture that says, though our sins are like scarlet, we're stained. We've been washed clean like fresh snow. Lord, I thank you that your word reminds us that we stand before you today as without a single fault, not because we have done everything right, but Jesus, you did everything right on our behalf. And out of that, we want to live lives that respond to your goodness. So Jesus, our prayer today, continue to transform us. Continue to change us. Lord, speak to us. Remind us that you see us. Remind us that you are calling us up to greater things. Lord, I pray that we would not be content with where we've been, but Lord, that we would lean into all that you have for us. Thank you that your blood makes a way for us. In Jesus' name, let's go ahead and partake. Amen. Can I invite you to stand to your feet across this room? And I'm gonna welcome us. We're gonna take 30 seconds right now can I welcome you to just lift your hands across this room and with your own voice, will you just begin to thank Jesus? Would you thank Jesus for what he's done in your life? Will you thank Jesus for the grace that he's poured out over you, over your family, the fact that he woke you up today, the fact that he's got a plan for your life, the fact that he's not done with you? Jesus, today, we lift our voice to you and we say thank you. God, thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Thank you for rescuing us and redeeming us. Jesus, thank you that you came to erase the gap between where we are and where we are meant to be. Thank you that you are still calling doubters to become disciples. God, that one moment with you can change everything. And Lord, I pray that in the coming weeks, we would encounter you in a fresh way. God, I pray for FaceTime moments over the people of Life Center. God, that it would show up at home, that it would show up as we're driving this week, that it would show up as we're walking through our day-to-day -day living. God, would you remind us that you desire to continue to change and transform us to look more and more like Jesus. God, we surrender to you. Pray that you go with us this week, strengthen us this week watch over us this week. 
And God, as we come back next Sunday, I pray that we would walk into this house full of faith and full of expectation of what you want to do in our lives. But God, let us not keep it with ourselves. God, would you allow this to be the greatest season of soul winning Life Center has ever experienced? God, I pray that we would share this hope and God, that our message would be simple to the people of Tacoma and Pierce County. Come and see. Come and see a God who's alive. Come and see the God who knows everything about you and yet he loves you. Come and see the way that he will transform your life. Come and see the hope that's available to us today. We thank you for it. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Listen, our pastors and prayer team will be available. If we can pray with you about anything, we would love to do that. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. God bless.